Okay, um, just to, to tell you that I apologize for my non-top form as the invited speaker. So, uh, on top of that, that I'm not in a top form, is that I will just bring you back to the old-fashioned resources and integration of them. So, just re relax. It is not chatbots, not so interesting, but um, I hope that... Um, yeah, it would be useful to share with you our own ideas on integration of um, resources. Okay, so um, yeah, plan of the talk, some background, introduction, our approach, analysis, and of course, discussion and conclusions. So in our latest work within Clada BG, uh, we consider creating integrated language resources like various types of dictionaries and corpora that should live together, be searched together, and uh, you should, the user should be um, very comfortable with um, um, using at the same time information from dictionaries and also from uh, the related corpora. The main benefit from such an integrating, also, although not trivial effort, is the verification of distinct resources that we try to combine. Uh, very often it turns out that uh, we find errors that uh, we couldn't find otherwise. So, simultaneous usage of complementary knowledge and also the problem of transfer of knowledge between resources within a language and across languages. Um, especially if um, in our, like our language, for example, we don't have such a nice book um, of Beth Levins about word, uh, verb classes, so exhaustive book. So we try to transfer some knowledge from English. Okay, so uh, here we report on our first attempts at integrating a tree bank, our bull tree bank. Um, it, of course, gives the syntactic structure. The valency dictionary, which provides the syntactic potential with verb meanings and related semantic rows, and uh, our WordNet of Bulgarian, uh, which provides the paradigmatic knowledge with the lexical senses in a hierarchical manner. So, um, I have always been saying that to me, valency dictionaries can be viewed as mini grammars that connect lexical potential with full fledged grammars. So, very, very important in some linguistic theories, like, for example, HPSG. Um, so, the first version of our lexicon was extracted uh, from the original constituency version of Boutry Bank and uh, the initial version followed the principles in hand-driven phrase structure grammar. So you can see the principles there. Um, unless the rule says otherwise, the mother's value of the valency features, specifier, which is the subject, complements and modifier, are identical to those of the head daughter. Okay, so we started this work a long time ago, 2012, as it says, and uh, we tried also to develop it uh, in some works later. Uh, in those works, however, the semantic roles in valency frames were viewed in a general way. Since only the lexicographic classes were used from WordNet with their prototypical roles, like, you know, six or five uh, roles, agent, patient, experiencer, team, and so on. So our resources in um, the first variants that were ready, um, they were deposited yeah, to Alexis and our repositories. And um, I know that when we finish our repository, Clarin One, we can also put them there as well. Um, so, however, these versions of 1.0, they respect only the syntactic constraints of valency and not so much semantics. So, what we try to combine, of course, several ideas, like Postyovsky's ideas on argument structure from the generative lexicon, uh, WordNet lexicographic classes, verb senses from BTB WordNet, and valency frames from VerbNet, the English resource here. Okay, so our work adheres to the following definition of argument structure. Um, 
it is um, assumed in generative frameworks the, that the argument structure specifies the number and type, both semantic and syntactic, of the arguments to a predicate. So in the generative lexicon, the argument structure is seen as a minimal specification of words lexical semantics. Uh, three types of arguments are introduced, true, that have been always realized syntactically, default, optional, can be uh, left unrealized, and shadow, uh, being part of the lexical meaning of the verb. For example, Mary built a house, we have two uh, obligatory ones, Mary and the house, and from bricks is a default one, because we can just uh, leave it optional. And uh, with the shadow arguments, for example, she buttered her toast with butter, it um, duplicates it. But if we say she buttered her toast with organic butter, then we have something to say on the surface. So it's a shadow one. Okay, so the knowledge transfer from English uh, has been performed in two ways. Um, through the mappings between the lexica in word nets, because all word nets are uh, more or less uh, interrelated through the open English word net now, and uh, through incremental localizations from verb net. So um, the adaptation went into these directions, the number and names of the rows, the verb grammatical behavior, and the treatment of metaphorical usages. Um, for the annotation task, um, we chose three annotators from Bulgarian philology with good knowledge of English. So they were our interns and they did this job. Uh, among the challenges during this process, uh, we had this. The various types of multi-word expressions, how to face them, how to uh, handle them, and also the metaphor metaphorical usages. And here just um, some examples, for example, um, a person celebrates an event, uh, we have um, the lexicographic word class of verb social and uh, the lemma and also the definition of uh, this lemma. But if we go to the uh, visualiz uh, visualization, we can also see the uh, thematic roles here, agent and team. Okay, so um, multi-word expressions are difficult to handle, of course. Uh, in expressions like I play cat and uh, mouse, the player is an agent, but always co-agent is presupposed in this situation. So um, both pseudo-complements are a coordinated team to the predicate, or the predicate and its pseudo-complements are viewed as a synonym of the verb chase, so we can go to a synonym verb and then we can live only with two roles like agent and co-agent. And for the moment I think I like both approaches to be um, kept. Um, another one with light verb construction, I'm stressing someone out or make someone on stress. Um, we have stimulus, experiencer and theme. It is verb emotion, but of course um, it is uh, more or less compositional and um, there are other ones that are not, like take a shower. And here we can see some frequencies of the um, valency frames per lexicographic class. Some of them coincide with the frequency of the verbs themselves, but not always. Uh, verb communication comes uh, always at the first, at the top place, but um, Verb cognition has um, many, many um, valency frames and um, otherwise the verb, um, the social verbs are more frequent than uh, cognition ones, but here with the frames they go uh, up. Okay, so our idea is to cross-check the verb semantic categories with the roles assigned within the distinct frames. Um, also, with such cross-checks, validation, uh, I mentioned that in the beginning, some validation can be made with respect to which verb groups get differing roles and what the reasons are behind the errors um, when using various resources like WordNets, WordNet and argument linking theories. So the inconsistencies, the wrong localization and um, so on. 
Okay. Um, we measured the number of the differing lexicographic classes between two annotators in their early stage of work. And so you can see that um, around one third, even more, um, is differing in their work. So the sources of disagreement that we could uh, figure out are matching more general definitions to more fine-grained ones with not always having good examples at hand or uh, handling of the multi-word expressions in one way or the other, more metaphorical, synonymical way or not. Um, so I would like to say that uh, for English there are many and for other languages there are many more attempts in integrated resources and it would be nice to see such initiatives also um, in our um, not so resourced languages, let's say, not so spoken languages. And here there is a list of um, the main challenges. Um, diversity imbalances within synsets, idiosyncrasy of multi-word expressions, um, non-homogeneous behavior of the reflexive verbs, various aspectual nuances of verbs, uh, missing meaning or frame, and so on, asymmetries between the languages, and especially these blurred boundaries among some semantic roles. Uh, for example, um, one of my students that worked, uh, she made um, a deeper study on contact verbs, and she realized that they are very close to the verbs of motion and verbs of change, and maybe such a flat hierarchy of uh, verb classes is not applicable anymore and should be made more hierarchical. And um, yeah, the handling of the optional arguments in the examples that have been attached to the respective senses. So yes, I think I'm in time. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. It was very interesting to hear about it. And I um, wanted to ask if you could go back just one slide to the challenges. There you mentioned the various spectral nuances of verbs. Um, so how do you plan to treat them so far? And uh, do you have any like preliminary solution? Because I might think of a theoretical framework where this um, spectral differences doesn't matter, at least in Slavic languages. Could you say how you treat it right now? Yeah, uh, in principles, they, they seem they don't matter, but actually they are uh, verbs um, when they are in some of the for example, the perfective aspect, they can have um, additional um, meanings, right? Which are not applicable to the non-perfective one. And so in this case, we prefer to just divide them. Yeah, I, I also wanted to say this because there is work by Dagmar Diviak. She works in Polish and uh, she has a series of experiments where she kind of shows that as factually different uh, verbs, even though they have the same stem sim uh, seemingly, they are treated differently in maybe a mind of a speaker. So I think this is a valid decision. Yeah, thank you. I would be um, yeah, happy if you give me the reference. Yeah, I sure. would like to yeah, have a look at that. Thank you.